A month ago, I uploaded this video, five easy things I did to go from unfit to fitter than average, seen by over 300,000, liked by 99.4%, a lesser YouTuber would let that 0.6% slide. They'd tell themselves, sure, it's 1,800 dislikes, but that could just be 1,700 fans of The Simpsons that thought the thumbnail promised more than they got, and 100 people with an irrational dislike of charismatic Englishmen with a hint of the Jason Statham about them but I am not a lesser YouTuber. So we have this video, five things I didn't do or didn't have in order to become fitter than average. And it's for those 1800, because I have a feeling some of them think my transformation was easier than I'm letting on. If my calculations are wrong and 0.6% of people just don't like Jason Statham, this isn't gonna help. So to clarify, this is not five things I didn't do because doing them would have been bad. This is not a list of things to avoid. In fact, some of these things I now do and wish I could have done back then. But the fact remains, I didn't, for reasons I'll cover. But first, if I didn't do them, why discuss them? Because I often hear from people who will say, well, of course you made the transition to being in shape, but it's not something others can do because you are somehow different or unusual or had access to something or benefited from something not available to everyone or whatever they want to use as a reason to reach the conclusion they want to reach, which is your advice doesn't count. And if my advice doesn't count and my advice is something like try and get off the sofa, then they don't need to do that. And sofas are comfortable. I get it. I love a good sofa. And if somebody wants to say, the advice to get off the sofa is good, but I'm just gonna stay on it anyway. Awesome, enjoy it. At one stage, I had the two-seater version of the one from Friends. Oh, yes. Had cup holder space, place for my Big Macs, it's furniture heaven. So saying that the advice to get off the sofa is good, but the sofa is better, I have no problem with that. But saying your advice is bad or in some way invalid is problematic because other people, people who might be on the verge of getting off their sofa, might see that sort of feedback and then use it as a reason to remain reclined themselves, surrounded by nuggets. Aww. And I should add, especially if you're a regular watcher here and thinking, well, hang on, you're always telling us not to copy you and that you don't like to give out advice and guidance. But now your advice is solid? Good point. This channel is not about saying you should do this or you should do that. It's certainly not about saying you should do what I do. This is stupid. Why do anyone want to do this? I have no program to sell, no app for you to download. You could use the code Mark Lewis 10%, but I don't know where you'd use it. This channel, it's really just motivation and entertainment. But that five easy things video, I made that very specifically about a period of time where I was going from very below average performance and just beginning my journey, a journey that I know was successful. And I also highlighted five things that I felt, even with my complete lack of real knowledge, would be pretty universal. Keep it simple, be consistent, don't overreact if it goes wrong, ignore negative feedback, have a little go at competition. In the world of fitness guidance, it was two plus two is probably four. Yet still, some people wanted to say, I can't rely on four being the right answer because you blah, blah, blah and that sets you apart from normal people, and thus your advice is not for normal people, so maybe two plus two is actually more nuggets, please. And while half of me thinks, no, it's for you lunatic, there is nothing that could exist about my situation, my resources, my particular circumstances, that means obviously correct things are no longer obviously correct, there's the other half of me that understands the impulse to discount even obviously good ideas. When I wake up in the morning and I'm supposed to go running, a good idea, I will still look for anything to be a hurdle to put in my way. Daily Mail article says running could cause hiccups. We'll pump my own brakes. This might need further investigation. Bottom line, especially in the early stages of any self-improvement journey, you are going to encounter hundreds of hurdles. It is not a smooth path from unfit to fit, from too fat to in shape, from unhealthy to healthy. Hurdles everywhere, whatever you do. So why not just stick one right in front of you right now, save you falling over one at some point, inevitably anyway. I get the impulse to grab at hurdles, even if you have to create a hurdle where one didn't really exist. So the point of this video is not to berate people for doing that, I do it. And it certainly isn't to express any negativity towards the people that heard the five easy things, placed no hurdle in front of themselves, but still did not find themselves motivated to get off the sofa. I may just not be your source of motivation, or it might just not be the right time for you. My message is not those five things are easy, so what on earth is wrong with you if you don't do them? 
I have stood in my kitchen at three o'clock in the morning many times telling myself how easy it would be to not open the freezer and devour the Ben and Jerry's and done it anyway. I get easy isn't always easy. No, the point is simply that maybe somebody will hear what I'm about to explain and then find themselves thinking, well, if he did those five easy things without the stuff that he's just explained that he never had, maybe I should stick on my trainers and wander outside. One, I didn't have any time. This is such a big one and a good one to start with because of all the five things, this is the one that has now changed the most for me. Today, almost 50 years old, I have all the time in the world. I can work out when I want, however I want, for as long as I want. It makes my situation incredibly abnormal. When people see movie stars getting in shape for a film and they say it was easy for them, they can spend as much time as they like working on it. My situation, way better than theirs. I don't even have a film to make. So if you have a job, family, kids, responsibilities, you aren't going to have the flexibility to spend time on yourself like I do now. But I didn't start like this or require this privileged situation to get things underway. When I began my journey, I was mid-30s, my youngest child was a toddler, my eldest about 14, I had two others in the middle, two dogs, a job that meant I worked long hours every day, including weekends, and a marriage on the verge of collapse. Every spare moment I had was taken up with worrying about everything. When my kids were screaming, my wife was shouting, my dogs barking, my boss looking at me in disgust, it didn't leave me thinking, oh, plenty of time for jogging. I didn't roll out of bed, complete my gratefulness journey, and then meditate before breakfast. I didn't come home from work and twiddle my thumbs, pondering how much cardio should I do today. My day was filled up with one time-consuming disaster after another. So my initial steps into fitness were grabbed where I could find them after everyone had gone to bed before they got up. Every dog walk became a dog jog. If the kids had a sports club thing, I'd drop them off, then go run, then go fetch them. When driving to work, I'd park 10 minutes away from the office. Luckily, at that stage, I could only run for a short time anyway, so I didn't need to grab hours and hours. Bits here and there were enough. But I still had to work at finding those bits. I watched no TV in those first couple of years. I had no hobbies. I spent no spare time on anything other than grabbing my trainers and going for a quick run and then hoping that when I got home, the house hadn't been declared an active crime scene. Are there people out there with even less time than I had? Of course there are. Maybe you've got eight kids, three jobs. Some people will have it worse, but the majority of people are still finding time for Netflix, scrolling through social media, shopping for crap they don't need online, and then saying, no time to be healthy. Two, I didn't spend any money. I didn't have any. I was in debt, massively. My business, a disaster. Divorce on the horizon. I bought a pair of cheap trainers and the book Born to Run, but I wasn't throwing money at getting fit. I didn't have a fancy sports watch. I didn't need one. I ran till I was gasping for air and then walked. I didn't need GPS tracking for that. And when I did get a watch, it was just a cheap, simple G-Shock that did me fine for years. I wasn't entering expensive races when I did start doing competitions. It was park runs and those were free. I had no expensive fancy kit, no wacky gadgets. I had lampposts in the street, they're free. And I would jog to one and then walk to another and then jog. So no money. But even if I'd been rich, it's an odd one to use someone's wealth as an easy way to write off any fitness achievements they make. I recently did a video on how fast Mark Zuckerberg runs and people were in the comments saying, well, of course he's crazy fast. He's a billionaire, as though all billionaires are running around really quickly. Uh, he still has to put one foot in front of the other as fast as he can. He can't buy breathing heavy and pushing to a place of discomfort. It's not for sale. And even if he could, there's still some eight-year-old out in Kenya probably running to school quicker than Zuckerberg does a 5K. You simply don't need wealth to have improved health. It does not cost money to not eat more than you need. It does not cost money to not drive that short journey you didn't need to use the car for. Even now, when I spend money on all sorts of fitness-related nonsense, the fundamentals that truly keep me healthy are as much self-control as I can find in the kitchen and then going outside to raise my heart rate. Neither have a price tag, yet both buy me something of huge value. And I do mean that, huge value. If I had to wake up tomorrow with either my flash car gone or back looking for 40-inch waist jeans, take the car. Of course, the irony is that if my neighbours saw the car had gone, they would think that something was up. But if I put on so much weight that I struggled to get in the car, I doubt they'd even notice. Three, I didn't have any support. This one was tough, though. I had no one supporting my efforts. 
My kids were too young, my family was more concerned about my imploding marriage than my exploding waistline, and my friends and workmates really uninterested in health and fitness. And this was a while ago. YouTube was cats playing pianos. It wasn't a case of finding your favorite fitness influencer and off you go. Stay hard! I had me. I didn't come home from runs to be told well done. I didn't go out for runs being wished good luck. Today, I have my wife training with me. My kids work out too. I can go and tap into hundreds of thousands of people online that give me positive feedback on how I'm doing anytime I want. It's incredible, but it isn't essential. If you make the decision to crack on with it, you are good to go. You don't need anything else or anyone else. In fact, even to this day, I prefer training alone most of the time because it's how I trained then. I don't wanna get all goggins about this. Stay hard! But I found positivity in going it alone. Running at night, feeling terrible, exhausted, knowing I would get home to a house that couldn't care less, no training partner, no coach, just me dodging traffic and badgers, I was fine with that. But in order to be fine with it, I did have to constantly remind myself that following the masses, doing what everybody else does, acting in a way that does allow yourself to be surrounded by like-minded people, that isn't necessarily a good thing. In fact, when it comes to health and fitness, because we live in a time where the vast majority of people are a perfect indication of what not to do and what not to be like, doing something they aren't, statistically, you're probably on the right path. Stick with it and eventually you will find the small number of other people out there like you, but it can be lonely at first. It's like being in a zombie movie where a small group of survivors are trying to find other survivors. But if you are a survivor, you try and stay one. You don't go join the zombies just because there's more of them and you get to hang out together. Four, I didn't have crazy willpower. That last one makes it sound like I woke up every day and just told myself, you got this and was out the door, past the Cocoa Pops, cheeky five miler for breakfast. If you're a regular watcher, you'll know that wasn't the case and still isn't. I have crazy disordered eating syndrome. That's not an official diagnosis. I don't think professionals are too fond of crazy in their labeling, but it's what I have. I've done enough videos on my eating habits to not need to go into huge detail here. Suffice to say, to this day, I still struggle with controlling what I eat way beyond a point most people have to contend with. Every time I do describe it, people say, whoa, that's a mental health issue. You have a problem there. I know. My point of mentioning it here is that it's very easy for people to think that anyone getting on top of their health, their fitness, their physique, whatever it might be, must have that sort of positive mental mindset attitude that you see from the lunatics yelling at you from Facebook and Instagram, telling you embrace the pain and relish discomfort. It's mind over matter. I've never had that mindset. I do not like doing things that routinely leave me in discomfort. I might do the odd event that appears to be rather unpleasant. This is stupid. But day to day, my training is stuff I enjoy, done at a level of intensity where that enjoyment is not threatened because the level of willpower that I can draw upon and the ever-present possibility of binge eating derailment means I'm always on a tightrope. In fact, I'm not because I regularly fall off, but hopefully I am some reasonable evidence that you can fall off and still make progress. Life is not perfect. You don't need to be perfect. You do what you can do, when you can do it, and when you can't, you don't beat yourself up over it too much. Five, I didn't use anything fancy. This last one is just a bit of a catch-all. I'm told all the time it's easy for me because I have a sauna, I do a cold plunge, I get massage therapy, I've got a great gym, I take supplements, I get medical treatment instantly, something goes wrong with me. I have recently had my knee injected with painkillers. I had my hormone levels fixed because they were a mess. Yes. My current situation allows me to explore every possible opportunity that sounds like it might be fun or help me or ideally both. So the hope is these will make a really big difference and they should because they cost almost 300 pounds. I am very, very lucky, but I did none of that to go from day one out of shape to being above average. All the fancy stuff has been in the last few years and interestingly, it's proven to be nothing more than thin icing on the cake. I am, for example, faster now than I was a few years ago, but only slightly. My 5K park run went from over 40 minutes to under 20 off the back of just eating less and jogging regularly. In the last few years, I've spent thousands of pounds on my continuing journey. I've knocked about another minute off. So you don't need the icing on the cake. And I know it's easy to think you do, especially when you have so many influencers telling you the latest icing is borderline essential and you should use their code to order yours immediately. But if tomorrow 
I woke up and my Garmin watch, my creatine, my protein powder, my massage gun, my carbon fiber shoes, if they all vanished, then my fitness levels in a year from now would be 99.9% .9 dependent on whether I stayed off the sofa, not whether I replaced all that junk. I would replace all that junk immediately because it's all very cool stuff, but cool stuff is not essential. That's it. Basically, I was in the position many people are in. No time, no money, no support, struggled with motivation, didn't own 300 pound shoes that looked like a sex toy. The hole's quite tight. That's what she said. <laughs> but the point of this video is not to feel sorry for the state I was in or to be impressed that I got myself out of it. It's to simply understand it can be done from that place. Not it should be done, not I'm your mum, this is what you have to do, just that it can be done. Not every hurdle is as high as you think it might be. Ultimately, I didn't sort myself out off the back of the resources and opportunities that I have today. I did it off the back of this premise. My life then was in many ways not going how I hoped, and I decided there was probably two potential different futures ahead of me. In one, my job, my marriage, my home life continued to be a train wreck, and the last thing I wanted to do was compound those problems with ongoing poor health and zero fitness. Or at some point in the future, everything would be amazing. And I thought, well, if that's the case, surely I wanna be in the best possible state to take advantage of that. Either way, maybe I should stick on my trainers and wander outside.